Hey, will you join me in thanking Luke and the rest of the crew this morning? <laughs> Nate and Paul and Drew and Dave and Elizabeth. And thank you. Thank you for leading us. It's wonderful. Well, I want to say thank you on behalf of Ellen and me. Um, I, this, I'm not allowed to have favorite places I go speak, especially when things are posted online. I am? Oh, okay. But if I were, um, seriously, this, this would be it. When you grow up in normal Illinois and you can put together ocean and redwoods, um, those were not part of where I grew up. It is true that a woman from our town married a man from a smaller town down the road, and it did indeed say in the paper, normal woman marries oblong man. <laughs> um, that's kind of where the fame of normal Illinois peaked, was right there. Everybody thought it was hilarious, except the bride and her mother were not happy. But if you're the editor of the Daily Panagraph, there's no way you're passing that one up. There's just no possible way you're going to say no to that. Josh and Molly, where are you? Are you here this morning? Are you? They're in the back. Hey, wow, way back. I'll tell you what, I, I, would, I would teach any place Josh and Molly were going. It's been a joy to meet you for the first time. Um, you know, a lot of people talk about there's shallowness in the next generation, there's not depth. Uh, I submit to you Josh Weidman and his teaching. That was just exquisite. Not only exegesis, the study behind it, but the packaging and the presentation of um, a message that we desperately need to hear. You know, Judges ends, ends up, the very last verse says, everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Aren't you glad you don't live in a nation like that? <laughs> I'll bet back then they had to take a Gallup poll to decide if something was right or wrong. Um, the book of Judges is like ripped from the headlines today. And uh, Josh, thank you. It's been, a, it's been a joy to share together. Come back by the table. I'm telling you, crazy Ellen has lost her lease. Everything must go. We've discovered something about our resources. They change many more lives when they're in your hands than in our warehouse. It's just, I don't know why that is. Um, but there's a, there's a lady we haven't even met yet, um, but I got this secondhand through. What is your name, the wonderful lady next to it, my wife? Jean what? Jean Murphy. Jean Murphy. How many of these series have you used in your Bible study? Nine. Nine, and she just brought Catalyst because her group's like, what's the next one? What's the next one? Um, so you talk, talk to her. Um, if, you like just, if you like just meat and potatoes Bible teaching, let the Scripture teach for itself. We train a lot of under-resourced pastors around the world. You know, you get outside the United States and Western Europe and it's 70 or 80 percent of pastors have no formal Bible training at all. And, and you should be with a room full of pastors when they're looking at their notes and they're looking at the screen and they're like, I see where that point came from. It's in the verse that we're talking about and then came the point. And you go, you just cracked the code. And they go, is that like, is that a good thing? Should I do that even when I'm not teaching walkthrough materials? And I'm like, that would be not just a good thing, that would be a great thing. And if you like just kind of nothing fancy, meat and potatoes, Bible teaching, our, our Indian director heard one of our other regional directors say that. And he goes, what is this meat and potatoes? And so somebody explained, it's just the basics. It's a solid, nutritious meal. It's not fancy. And he goes, oh, he just starts laughing. He goes, he goes everybody calls Phil the curry and rice guy in India. <laughs> and he says, it's like, it's like what you need. You can digest it every day. And sometimes there's a little spice there, too. So I'll, I'll take it. 
There's a little mini theme developed last night. You heard it in a couple of the songs today, too, about darkness and light. Um, Man, Josh called down power from heaven last night, didn't he? Sorry about the rest of the valley that had to be part of our sermon illustration here. But I want to share two things that... um, I just think this is, this is too weird to be coincidental. Uh, Tim Blackman, who uh, is sharing up at Ponderosa at High Camp, he, he texted me and I'm, I'm sure some other people, okay, they're younger than we are, so they were behind our schedule last night because they just run later than we do, right, at camp. He says this, 45 minutes, how many of you have kids up at camp? Okay, good, this is, this is your kids here. 45 minutes before the evening session, there's a power outage on the entire mountain. Estimated time of return is 1 a.m. We had already planned an acoustic set and decided to just press on. We worshiped in the dark without sound system, (laughs) without screen. Kids used a QR code on their phones to access the lyrics, and we had a beautiful time singing in the dark. Then I got up to speak and was going to use a combination of my computer and phone to access notes and Bible text. The moment I said, Lord, in the light or without light, we come to you. Even without electrical power, we have the power of your spirit and the devil is a liar. As I said these words, the light came on. We were able to have the remainder of the session as if nothing happened. It was a powerful night. (laughs) This morning, as our fiscal year in at Walk Through the Bible ends June 30, an email went out to uh, um, our partners all over the place. So I received this email. I heard the story um, actually on Tuesday, but the email went out today. Okay, you can't plan this stuff. God is so far ahead of us. Uh, Some greetings, and it says, 14-year-old Ilya was born and lives in Kiev. In September of 22, Ilya's neighbor invited him to an art studio that was opened by her parents. He decided to go, gathered, this is his quote, gathered with a cheerful company of strangers. I was having fun. We are engaged not only in painting and art, we also have discussions about things. Study the lives of different people, talk about life themes, play games and visit exhibitions, he says. In November, the art studio held a small interactive event, he says, which was to walk us through the Bible at an art studio. Too cool. I had only heard about the Bible before that. In my family, we don't talk about God. But I like this active Bible. At home, I showed my grandmother the hand signs. Some of you know this. We take creation and fall and flood. and We we just make it active and you get involved. I showed the hand signs to my grandmother, one of those babushkas that's probably been praying for Ilya for years, and boasted that I now know the Bible. I was very interested in Joshua. The Bible also talks about wars which is interesting to us right now. Wow. In December, Kiev began to be shelled again. It was winter and very cold. I was with some friends out on the street. We, had, we heard the air raid alarm. During an air raid alert, it is required that everyone must be in a shelter. So Ilya and his friends ran to the nearest bomb shelter. There were already about 30 people gathered there. The lights went out intermittently. You seeing a theme here? There was a crying child, and everyone was very nervous. Then the lights went out and stayed out for a long time. As Ilya described it, the atmosphere was getting creepy. Then I had a thought. He said, I asked my friends to shine their phone flashlights on my hands and on the ceiling. And in a minute, I told and showed the Bible from creation to Christ. As we were taught in the art studio, naming each hand line. In the end, I said, this is the Bible. There was silence from the people. After a couple of minutes, the lights came back on, and they didn't go out again. 
After 40 minutes, the alarm ended and no more announcements were made until the end of the day. I had a feeling that after my Bible shadow theater, that's what I called it, God gave us light in the bomb shelter and some kind of peace. The atmosphere in the bomb shelter definitely changed. The horror was gone. After the, we left the bomb shelter, my friends and I discussed this moments later on the street. Can God really exist? A couple of them said, wow. Father, thank you that you have taken us, many of us, from darkness to light. Lord, it's very possible that there's still some here who are who are still lost. Lord, before this week ends, take them from darkness to light so they can join us. Not just darkness to light, not just sickness to health, Lord, but death to life, eternal life. That's why this place has existed now for 117 years. The darker that things get around us, the more impactful the light seems to shine through so lord take mount herman keep this place strong in the midst of a leadership transition lord lead the right person here call the team to continue to be all in and keep this place without compromise committed to the word of god now this morning we also need light from you as we finish our series on Barnabas. So, Lord, please do that. For your glory and our good, we pray. Amen. Well, how about we finish strong today? It's the last session. Just draw it together. Three points, a poem, and a prayer, and let's go home. I don't, I don't, I don't. That's not how I roll. It may be that this particular lesson is the single most important one. We've been talking about Barnabas. Barnabas was a catalyst, that little something added to a stable situation that causes just, just a disproportionately large reaction. Barnabas, not one of the headliners in the Bible. You got to look in the cracks of the storyline to even find him. Maybe like a numerous people have talked to me, you're like, huh, I, I, it stretches the imagination to think that I could be an Esther or a Ruth or a Mary or a Moses, a Simon Peter, but I, I could do the Barnabas thing. Then you've heard from the Lord and you got the message of this session. In each session, Barnabas recognized something important and then he set about to do it. Session one, read it with me. Barnabas recognized his purpose and pursued it. He got about it. Oh yeah, you want handouts? Here, we have handouts. Session two, read it with me. Barnabas recognized a need and met it. All different kinds of needs we talked about. Session three, this was yesterday when it started to really get good. Barnabas recognized faith and nurtured it. Saul, who everybody else said, oh, please, like we're going to just welcome you into our fellowship, you persecutor of the church. But Barnabas discerned that his faith was legit and got him a hearing. Well, today, the fourth time, and I'll just give it to you up front today, usually I save this till the end, Barnabas recognized potential and developed it. Say that with me. Barnabas. So when last we were with Barnabas and, and Saul, you know, so he gets in with the believers he's received. He begins teaching powerfully. There's a plot to kill him off, just as he had tried to kill who he thought were false teachers. Then he learns the truth. He moves from darkness to light, we could say. Now other forces of darkness are going to kill him, and so the believers help him to escape, and he goes to Tarsus. And most scholars believe he was there like 14 years. 
I don't think knowing Paul that he just sat idly by, but there's no record of big public ministry. I think it was probably a time, certainly serving God, but it's also a time he has a lot to unlearn. He has a lot new to learn. I cringe every time we do this to, you know, a Hollywood, a Hollywood personality or, or maybe a professional athlete, a political leader. God draws that man or woman to himself and we rejoice. And about three minutes later, somebody hands him a microphone and says, now, go tell the world. There's nothing like the boldness of a new believer. But that need for grounding, that need to build a solid foundation, I think the story of Saul just reinforces God is not after just converts. He wants to make us disciples, fully committed followers of his. So we pick up the story now later. Acts eleven twenty five. 25, then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, like 10, 14 years later, somewhere in there. Why? We'll find out in a minute. When he found him, he brought him back to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. Antioch needed a pastor. Barnabas goes, I know a guy. I know a guy. And he goes to Tarsus. He brings Saul back with him. And they teach together for a year little tucked in thing there it says the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch so there's your fill-ins Barnabas found Saul and he brought him to Antioch to help lead the church second fill-in in Antioch the disciples were first called Christians well what else would they call them they were Christians now this is brand new and this is not this is not a complimentary title Literally, it means little Christ, many messiahs, Jesus wannabe. And when they were called that, it's like, well, look at that little mini Jesus praying for people, preaching like Jesus did, telling some parables. Wow, you even pulled off a few miracles. Impressive, little Jesus, little mini Jesus. Not a positive term, this term Christian. So things are going well in Antioch. In Acts 13, God is the great disruptor. This is one of those catalytic interventions by God. Acts 13, 2 says, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Well, I thought they were doing the work to which he called them. It's comfortable, it's working, there's success, there's growth. The Holy Spirit says, it's time for a new assignment. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. The two of them, sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. Oh, by the way, John, who is, we find out later, John Mark, John went along as their helper. So the Holy Spirit sent Barnabas and Saul on their first missionary journey. The church I grew up in, we would have an annual missions conference. I shouldn't, I shouldn't, I'm not making fun of it. But through the eyes of a kid, there were many entertaining things about those conferences. We, we used to bet, not large sums of money, usually a trip to Dairy Queen, on whether the missionary slide would indeed end with a sunset. Because you had pretty good odds if you bet on that. One time, 
certain friends of mine, I was usually the idea person who didn't have the guts to go do any of it. And I'd whisper something and my foolish friends would go do it. And if they got busted, I had plausible deniability. My fingerprints were not on that. We, we may have taken the last slide out of somebody's deck and turned it upside down just for grins. I'm glad nobody messed with my PowerPoint today. There were two brothers, twins, Don and Ron Corley. They, they were clearly the fan favorites. One of them, they'd come up, they'd stand together. They were identical. They still dress exactly alike every day into their 50s, maybe beyond. One of them would start out and go, hi, 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 and the other one would go deep on the Navajo reservation. The witch doctor chants his evil spell. Hi, 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 hi. And <laughs> we, we could all do the Corley brothers. It was, it was amazing. My parents, again, I told you, my dad's faith, if it existed at all, was in embryonic form. My mom, farther along. But even so, also my mom said, now, you know, son, <laughs> It's okay to be a pastor if, if you're not gifted enough to do anything else. <laughs> God's given you a good brain, so you ought to be a doctor. That was the extent of my career counseling. It wasn't until my third year at Wheaton College. I'm in, I'm in organic chemistry my second year. If you don't care, you don't belong in organic chemistry. <laughs> I'd gotten involved with the navigators in a Bible study, and I was... I was leading a, a group of freshmen, and man, it was, it was just the greatest. And I'm getting this, this, this passion to communicate God's word. Somebody started giving me Howard Hendricks cassette tapes, and I'm just consuming those. And then junior year, I met this girl from Charlotte, North Carolina, with hazel eyes, and she had me at y'all. And we, I was locked in the friend zone for a while. Hard to get out of that place. <laughs> and on our first official date, which was to the second chapter of Acts, if you're old and you remember that group, yeah, yeah. Um, I said, what do, you, what do you think you'll be when you grow up? I had never asked a girl that. And she goes, you're going to laugh at this. She goes, but I've always, I've always just known that I, I would mar marry somebody in ministry, probably a Bible teacher, probably not just at one church, but, but somebody who had a ministry to other pastors. That's a pretty refined vision <laughs> for, for 19 years old. I'm like, seriously? She was like, yeah, seriously. You know, it is not a complicated process to switch your major at most <laughs> universities. <laughs> That's not why I did it, but it was God's gracious, really beautifully hot way of confirming <laughs> his guidance in my life. God loves to disrupt things. My parents also said, this is, this is terrible. I apologize. I apologize for this. They said, Anybody can be a pastor. What a joke. Is there a more difficult way of serving? Than, well, yeah, there is. To be a pastor's wife is harder. <laughs> but beyond that. And I got the impression that if you're really not very good and can't cut it here, then you go overseas and do it. Shame on me. Shame on you if you've bought into that. To take what we do and connect it cross-culturally, that's tough to do. That's the calling of God on Barnabas and Saul. And off they go on what we call the first missionary journey. John Mark goes along as their assistant. Now, along the way on this first missionary journey, there's a subtle but significant change. It starts out Barnabas and Saul. 
Barnabas and Saul. Barnabas and Saul. It's not a clear cut, and then on this day, everything changes. It goes back and forth some. But you start reading more often Saul and Barnabas. Whoa. When I was first introduced to Barnabas by my mentor, Dr. Howard Hendricks, he said, think about that for a minute. Barnabas is the guy, Saul's assisting him, John Mark's carrying the luggage or something. And partway through the trip, Saul's gifting starts to emerge. And now he's, he's preaching more. Maybe he's drawing bigger crowds. We don't know, but you start hearing Saul or Paul and Barnabas. In fact, there's, there's one or more times when it actually says Paul and his associates. Well, that's got to hurt. And I can remember Dr. Hendricks saying, I don't know five senior pastors in America who could handle it if one of their associates turned out to be a more gifted communicator than they were. Now, I'm, I'm, what, 22 years old sitting in his class, the possessor of most wisdom at 22. I had so many more answers then than I do now at 65. And I'm sitting there in judgment, and I'm like, that's why the American church is so weak. That's terrible. Those people should be ashamed of themselves. And then Hendricks goes, he just looked around the room, and I'm telling you, he locked eyes with me. I think probably like 105 of us thought he did that. And he goes, when that happens to you, and if you're a developer of people, it will. I want you to picture me sitting on your shoulder going, does that threaten you or does that thrill you? Sometimes I'm thrilled by that. I think it's wonderful if, if God used Josh's ministry to touch you more deeply this week than mine did, I say praise God for that. And even though I had the mornings, so it's Phil and Josh, Phil and Josh, if you go home thinking, we heard Josh and Phil, and then three weeks from now, it's Josh and some other guy. <laughs> That's fine. I can pass that test. It's a little more difficult when it comes to the own organization that I lead. We got a nice grant from a foundation to take what we teach in creation, fall, flood, nation, the big picture, and not using hand signs and not trying to take what we do as a live event that comes to your churches, but put it together a small group that taught the big picture, the overview of the Old Testament, taught it differently. We got our whole leadership team together. We came up with different ways that it could be presented. You could do it biographically. You could do it chronologically. You could do it blah, 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 blah. And, and geographically got thrown in there. And then we drew out of a hat. They didn't let me draw because they go, well, Phil gets biographical. So just take that one out and hand it to Phil. Then everybody else drew. This guy named Michael who's on our staff, he's our executive VP, he's 10 times the administrator and business mind that I have, but he's also got a communication gift. He's also, you know, 20 years younger than I am. And when we drew out of the hat, everybody was drawing, and Michael was leading this meeting, and he went last, and we're like, <laughs> geographical is last. Michael's stuck with geography. And he pulls it out, and he's like, okay, so everybody's got two weeks, put together your plan, come back, sell everybody, we'll vote on which one we like best, and off we go. Okay, I'm the president. Hitting the major characters? That would work in a small group. I put together a pretty sweet presentation, so did a couple of the other leaders. Michael presented his, and we're like, yeah, Michael, sorry about the geographical thing. And he goes, actually, I'm kind of excited about it. He talked about seven mountains in the storyline of the Old Testament. And we could talk about what happened leading up to that mountain. And then on that mountain, what happened there. And then the view of the, from the mountain looking forward. 
And he's like, we could use animation and different things of the, what leads up to the mountain. And then he goes, we've got money in this. I would, I, I, we should teach from that place in Egypt, in Jordan, in Israel. And then use the animation for what comes next. And we all sat there and we went, that's a winner. There's nothing else like that. He goes, I th we ought to call it OT panoramic. I'm like, yeah, we should. And he goes, he goes, Phil, do you think I could teach this with you? And I went through clenched teeth, Michael, God birthed this idea in you. I think you ought to just do it. You ought to just do it. That is one of the best things Walk Through the Bible has done in years. OT Panoramic, you can stream it from our app, take it and run with it. Does that threaten you or does that thrill you? Uh, uh, ask me again in a year, because I don't know yet. I don't know yet. I'm still trying to pass that test. Are you thrilled when your kids show gifting that you could only dream about? Oh, yeah, I'm so proud of my kid. Our board chair was a, cardi uh, a heart surgeon, had 70 docs in his practice, was chief of surgery at a big hospital in Indianapolis. His last week of working, his wife went with him and just shadowed him some. And all these nurses were going, Dr. Ish, we love Dr. Ish. He's the kindest to us. He values what we do as nurses. His patients seem to heal faster than other patients. And, you know, just the other day, there was this complex, just this, this leg had been shattered, and he put it back together, and she realized they weren't talking about her husband. They were talking about her son, because he's the orthopedic surgeon. And this woman goes, my first response was, wait a minute. This is my husband's last week. I'm here with him. And you're like, he's already forgotten, and you're talking about my son. And then she went, oh, yeah. That's kind of what we dream of as parents, isn't it? Leonard Bernstein, who won Grammys and Tonys and Emmys, great conductor, composer, too, was asked, what is the most difficult instrument to play? Second fiddle, without a doubt. I can get any number to play first violin, but to find one who plays second violin with as much enthusiasm is a real problem. Of course, second French horn or second flute would be similar, and yet if no one plays second fiddle, we have no harmony. It's not just ministry. It's at home. It's in business. It's in the orchestra. Barnabas recognized potential and developed it. Paul, that was good. Was, was it? You think so, Barnabas? He may have coached him a little bit. But Saul eventually is the headliner. Sometime later, and excuse me, I have to lift this up because whoever was the person who helped me do this PowerPoint has younger eyes than I do. Wow. Sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back and visit the believers in all the towns where we preach the word. Preach the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them. But Paul did not think it wise to take him because he had deserted him in Pamphylia and had not continued with them to the work. We got to act this one out. Okay, this is not, you don't get pirates' costumes to be a part of this drama, so don't get excited. Okay, here we go. Stand up, sir, please. Sir, would you stand up, please? This is Saul. Everybody say, hi, Saul. Hi, Saul. 
You can call him Paul. Hi, Paul. Paul. Who's this? Barnabas. Barnabas. And they're going to go on another missionary journey. And and they got right here. Barney, will you stand up? And and Barnabas, or I mean, Barnabas goes, you're John Mark, sorry. Okay. And and, uh, you want to take John Mark along. Now, you're not here listening to this conversation, so move over there a little bit. (laughs) Saul says, there's no possible way. He he flaked out in the middle of the first trip. God's work is too important to be entrusted to somebody who's not dependable. Now, I don't know that this dialogue took place like this. I have what is hopefully a sanctified imagination. (laughs) But Barnabas, you know, Barnabas, this encouraging guy, I think he got in Saul's face. And he probably said something like, and there may have been fingers pointed to chess. You know, there was a time not long ago nobody wanted to give you a chance. If there's anybody on earth, Saul, who ought to be big on second chances and new beginnings, it ought to be you. That's impressive that you thought of that right on the spot. <laughs> Who's right? Trick question. They're both right. It's also kind of sad that such a sharp disagreement that they separated. You took John Mark. You went that away. You grabbed Silas. Hey, Silas. (laughs) And you went a different direction. Good or bad? Good. Ugly process. Even today, Is it not true that we often multiply by division? Shame that you let that sever your relationship. Great that we have a God who can even redeem our stupidity for his own glory. It's a really cool part later on where Saul, so driven, so task-oriented, near the end of his life says, bring with you John Mark. Because he's useful for service. That's as close as you'll ever get to an apology from a guy like Saul. Okay? (laughs) Will you give these four a hand? You made that a lot clearer. So we've got some fill-ins. Because heaven forbid you leave here with some empty blanks. As they were preparing to go on a second missionary journey, Paul and Barnabas had a major disagreement Disagreement is your fill-in. They divided. Barnabas took John Mark. Paul took Silas. This is the fourth lesson. Barnabas recognized his purpose and he pursued it. They, They even renamed him. His name was not Barnabas. What was it? Joseph. Good name. Strong biblical name. We think your parents missed, so we're going to call you Barnabas. One called alongside, like the Holy Spirit is our encourager. Barnabas, when, when people are around you, you have the same effect on them that the Holy Spirit does. We want to do more for the Lord. So we're going to call you Barnabas. And he accepted that. He recognized his purpose and pursued it. He recognized a need and met it. He sold his land so that people could stay and get taught and mature in the scriptures. He recognized faith and nurtured it yesterday. And today he recognized potential and developed it. And he did it both with success. He was not threatened. He was thrilled. And he did it when John Mark had failed. He gave him a second chance. He was a man of grace. Good, you found me. You're catching up with me. I'm all over the place, the poor tech people. I can't help but ask these questions. Remember that little two words, but Barnabas? What if you take Barnabas out of this? He's just a little mento mint. 
He's not the big two liter thing of Diet Coke. What if God doesn't drop him into those situations? Would Paul, would Paul still have become the greatest theologian, missionary, and church planter in history? Now, I know, again, depending on your denomination, like, yes, God is sovereign. He doesn't need us. Well, that's all true. But somehow his sovereignty is also chosen to do his work through people, yes? And we'll figure it out when we get to heaven. Right now, we don't get it. But from a human point of view, Barnabas had a catalytic effect on the life of Paul. We'd all agree with that. Would the New Testament be missing the 13 books that Paul wrote? You can argue about Hebrews or not. Jeopardy had a big controversy about that a while ago because they took a position on that. And, man, that was wild. <laughs> and would John Mark have written his powerful second gospel? You take 13 and 1, it makes 14. That's 14 out of 27 books of the New Testament. Slightly more than half that Barnabas was the guy behind the guy doing the writing. And yet a week ago, a week ago, four days ago, when I started, for some of it's like, yeah, Barnabas, I think he's in there, good guy. Forty-some years ago, Barnabas became my personal biblical mentor. That's why I'm so passionate. I'm so glad we finally packaged this. And, and they are going crazy with this around the world because encouragement truly is the oxygen of the soul. There's not a person in this room who cannot have a Barnabas-style ministry. In the life of your own family first. I've talked a lot about your kids. How about with your spouse? Oh, please. Seriously? Somebody else can do that. No, with your spouse. Your pastor needs more Barnabas. Your church needs a Barnabas for every cubic foot. I heard about a church where... <laughs> Folks decided to take this real seriously, and they called themselves the Barnabas people. This little group, nobody even knew who they were. And they would look for people in the church who were serving in quiet, unseen ways, and they'd make sure they were home, and then they would call in and get a pizza delivered to those people's house. And Pizza Hut would put on the front, it, it was from the bodybuilders, the Barnabas people, hey, Bet you thought nobody knew that you come in and fold the bulletins every week for church. But we caught you. Enjoy the pizza. People start asking the pastor about this. The pastor's like, I have no idea. They got me one week too. Oh, come on, pastor. Who's doing this? He goes, I don't know. And they're like, aren't you supposed to know everything that happens in this church? Sure you are. Not really. Pastor goes to Pizza Hut. Hey, um, there's some folks, they're regular customers of yours. They're called this. You put a thing on top. Can you tell me who they are? And they're like, nope, they always pay cash. Pastor pulls out a church directory. Okay, I'd like you to look at some photos here. <laughs> Circle any of these folks who look familiar. Manager of the Pizza Hut is like, are you kidding me? goes, we sell them out. All this business goes to Domino's. We're not, no. We don't even know their names. They pay cash. And no, I'm not looking at your goofy little picture book. <laughs> How many people in your church do you think it would take with a mindset like that to transform your congregation? Not very many. And it doesn't even have to be an official ministry of the church. I want you to bow your heads, and I have two questions for you, and then we're going to sing a song and get on our way. But here's the two questions. Who in your life 
needs you to recognize their potential. What's the first step God wants you to take? I mean, you see a strength. You see a potential. You, you want to develop it. The second half of that is the second half of this passage. Who needs you to give them a second chance even though they disappointed you? What tangible move will you make this week? You, you can choose either one of those right now. If God gives you both of them, great. I have trouble focusing on more things than one at a time. So pick one of those. Think about it and pray that God will show you not just, man, that was so cool, that was so great, that was so encouraging, but when you get home, don't just be a hearer of the word, but be a doer also and be a Barnabas. Start it off kind of soft. Give them a chance to think and pray and then take us to celebration, will you? God bless you. Let's, let's worship together.